Hi, and welcome to this month's Verse Virtual. It's Poetry Month, and we have a fabulous triple feature for you today of uh, Jennifer Franklin, Lise Get, and Frank Taino. And I've been waiting and with anticipation for this reading for some months now. And I'm glad to have a whole new, mostly new group of poets here, many of whom I don't know and haven't met before and others. Um, it's great to have uh, fresh blood and I hope that you will check into our ar archive on the Verse Virtual 2024 webpage and um, listen to some of our past readings and sign up for future ones. It's great to have you and to have everyone who's listening to the videos as well. Um, today, we're going to start with Jennifer Franklin, and I've admired her poems for a long time, and I'm sure many of you have as well. Jennifer holds degrees from Brown University and Columbia University School of the Arts. She's the author of three full-length poetry collections, including If Some God Shakes Your House, finalist for the 2024 Patterson Poetry Prize. With Nicole Callahan and Pichenda Bao, she co-edited the anthology Braving the Body, which came out uh, in March. In 2021, she received both a uh, NYFA City Artist Corps grant and a Cafe Royal Cultural Foundation Literature Award. Her work has been published widely and I'm not going to read all of the publications. Um, in March 2023, Diane Seuss chose one of her poems for the Academy of American Poets, Poem a Day. Most recently, her poem, Memento Mori, Apple Orchard, was included in the eco poetry section of the Bedford Introduction to Literature. She teaches craft workshops in Manhattanville's MFA program and 24 Pearl Street of the Provincetown Fine Arts Work Center. For the past 10 years, she's taught manuscript provision at the Hudson Valley Writers Center, where she serves as program director. I welcome Jennifer Frank. Thank you so much, Robbie. It's so nice to be here and reading with Lise and Frank. Um, thank you all for coming. So many new faces. Uh, I don't know most of you. So I think I'll read um, a couple of poems from each of my three books, just as an introduction to my work. Um, most of my poetry is ekphrastic poetry or poetry based on myth. And a lot of it has to do with my daughter who's almost 24 years old and she has severe autism and epilepsy. So um, these poems are kind of the, the arc of um, finding out about her diagnosis and then, and then treating her. Um, this first one is called, I Would Like My Love to Die. And it's from my first book called Blooming. I would like my love to die or at least that I did not love you so much. If I could turn my heart to winter, I would not need to do this to the earth. If you did not smile in your sleep or plaster your palm to my face with tenderness, I could leave and shut the trap door of my hostile-lined heart without looking back. I would like my love to die so I would not have to murder everything around me, so I would not have to be the hunter I have become. But you are not going to release me from your unnatural embrace. You pin me beside you with your thin arm around my neck. It does not look strong enough to hold a small animal, but it is. And this poem is called my Daughter's Body, it was made into a short film um, for the Virtual Poetry Project, Visual Poetry Project, 
by an NYU student a few years ago. My daughter's body. If you saw her, you would think she was beautiful. Strangers stop me on the street to say it. If they talk to her, they see that beauty means nothing. Their sight shifts to pigeons on the sidewalk. Their eye contact becomes as poor as hers. They slip away with varying degrees of grace. I never know how much to say to explain the heartbreak. As her smile sears me, I hold her hand all the way home from the swings. The florist hands her the dying rose and she holds it gently without ripping the petals like she does to the tulips that stare at us with their insipid faces, pretending that they can hold my sorrow in their outstretched cups because I knew them, because I knew grief. They do not understand that they are ruined for me now. I planted 500 bulbs as she grew inside of me, her brain already formed by strands of damaged DNA or something else the doctors do not understand. After her bath, she curls up on me for lullabies, the only time that her small body is still. As I sing, I breathe in her shampooed hair and think of the skeletons in the Musée de Brihistoire in Les Azis. The bones of the mother and baby rest in a glass case in the same position we lie in now. They were buried in that unusual pose, child curled up in the crook of the mother's arm. The archeologists are puzzled by the position. It does not surprise me at all. It would be so easy to die this way. Both of us breathing our last breaths with nursery rhymes on our open lips. The promise of peaceful sleep. And this poem um, is from my second book, No Small Gift. Jennifer, I am so sorry. I accidentally muted you while I was trying to mute someone else who That's was okay. supposed to be on. No problem. I got it. This is called In This Version of the Story. There are no birds. Revenge is not a child's severed head held by the hair and flung into the face of a faithless father. The cruel hate nothing more than to witness love. Imagine a father sentenced to stare into the face of his daughter and see only fear. In this version, revenge belongs to the mother and her child, the lucky ones. For them, love is not a choice. Revenge means they're together, despite tragedy. When they carry flowers home to cut the stems, arrange them in the Sicilian jug, they're not trying. They recognize the face of contentment. In this version, there are no birds. And this poem is from my newest book, If Some God Shakes Your House. Um, I'll read the last poem in this book and then, um, then the, the quick sonnet um, that Diane Seuss chose. A lot of these poems in this book uh, are from the voice of a contemporary Antigone who has devoted herself to raising her disabled daughter. As Antigone, I still want to believe I can find some way to fix you, that if I go back to the beginning, retrace the disaster with the savant detective's obsession, I could uncover a cure, the smartest expert, some successful drug. Better yet, I want the pediatrician to give you a different diagnosis. I want to go back to the walk home, past restaurants and playgrounds, autumnal light catching all the auburn in your hair. I want to go back to the moment your father left us outside the cafe, consider handing you to him, 
all 47 pounds of you in your gingham pants and hot pink cardigan, Dalmatians decorating the little pockets and walk away without looking back. But I would never have left and I won't now. One way or another, you will be the end of me, inadvertent brute force, vector of virus, constant caretaking, your heavy body, forcing my remission's abrupt end. I know what's waiting, as certain as cloth hung to hold my scarred neck. I will not walk away. The moment the nurse pressed your splotched body into my arms, your needs fixed my fate. Constantly confused, your jagged voice requests Christmas songs all spring. You shove words of grace into my dry throat and I sing. I don't need a bottle of pills, white as sleep to silence me. Every ersat saint knows endless sacrifice is suicide. For 20 years, I have been disappearing. Touch me, I am not even here. And the last poem is the sonnet that Diane published on poets.org. It's called Preparing for Residential Placement for My Disabled Daughter. My life without you, I have already seen it. Today on the salt marsh, the red-winged blackbird perched in the tallest tree, sage green branches falling over the water. She sat there for a long time, doing nothing. As she lifted up to fly, the slender branch shook from the release of her weight. When the bird departed, it seemed the branch would shake forever in the wind, bobbing up and down. When it finally stopped moving, the branch was diminished, reaching out to the vast sky. Thank you so much. And thank you to Robbie for inviting me. Thank you for, so much for that beautiful set of poems. Okay. Give, I put a link to um, Jennifer's books. Uh, so if you would like to order any of them, there they are. Uh, I wish that it were possible virtually for poets to sell their books more easily, but that's the one bad thing about Sam. Our next reader is Lee's Get. She's published two poetry collections, Waiting for the Paraclete and The Leprosarian. And her third manuscript, The Radiant, is due out from Tupelo on Christmas Eve, 2024. Her awards include Robert B. Winner Award, the Paris Review Discovery Award, and the Palette Spotlight Award, the Penn Southwest Book Award, the D.H. Lawrence Fellowship, a grant from New Mexico Writers, and postgraduate fellowships from the Milton Center and the Creative Writing Institute at the University of Wisconsin. Um, again, um, I'm not gonna read all of the places that her poetry has appeared, but in a lot of very fine journals. Um, so take it away, Lise. Thank you so much, Robbie. It's such a pleasure to read for the, the Verse Virtual Community today that includes so many of you whom I know intimately through your poetry, but have never met you face to face. Uh, including the Kevin Bacon of poetry, Frank Paino. I'm going to read one poem today. It's a long poem. Um, so relax. And uh, it's it's the last poem in, in my forthcoming book, uh, The Radiant. It's called The Bookman. It is Easter Sunday, circa 1999, and snowing, a freak storm to be sure in Tucson, where it never snows, where the only sure wet comes in August, after a dry heat, sky bent like the upper and lower limbs of a bow pinned back at full draw, 
then let loose, snatching up a white mop of Lhasa Apso in an instant. The dog, the day, swept away from its original intent of hosannas. Buoyed by deluge, then dropped unceremoniously into what is. This is history. The first time snow has fallen on Easter in a century. Sifting above a makeshift shift lean-to, roofed but open, to a brick of baked caliche in Alden's backyard. Hypnotized by great flakes, pillowy tufts of white catching in the erect spines of agave, falling even slower than disaster at the moment it unhinges. We watch the crocheted lace of it fall, trace asymmetrical knots in a pine wood table, and await Alden's pies. Alden has promised to bake 20 pies, but 20 has morphed into two, an apple and a berry and a bottle of 80 proof. Everyone gently tipsy, feeling the swirl of the pillowy tufts, a gentle unmooring, not yet powerful enough to sweep us off our feet, our toes still gripping the bottom of existence. Perhaps there was also a ham, perhaps Mark, perhaps Christine, perhaps Francis were also there. Perhaps memory is a fiction. I can't remember, perhaps. If you wind the reel back, there was still time. Perhaps you can remember the time called before, before the all you can do is see yourself in a split second where you know, where you recognize that everything you've ever known before is going to be different after. Transfixed as you are, suspended in watching white flurries, waiting for pie in the promised land. Alden borders promised land of 20 pies. This is years before I let go of everything I love. The dog, the house, the agave, the table, before cancer takes Alden with the quickness of a flash flood, before I insist that my mother eat the host I have carried home in a gold pix. What am I to do with it if you refuse, I say. I want to know where to find you after you're dead. I was so certain. This was my tragic flaw, as if my own soul status were not in question, as if one were ever in a position to judge one's own profligacy or faith. I can't force her to take the Eucharist against her will, but I do. I take her free will away. I force her. And the day settles into what is, and she's gone. As in a child's cartoon, bang, bang, you're dead. Giant flakes as big as hands, falling even slower than disaster. The swirl of it as that moment unhinges. Where are they? In California, my parents are getting ready for bed, quail sifting secretly through the new riots of mustard, golden after the rains, all of it yellowing into a sauterne end of day. My dutiful father, already dressed for bed, sat out the recycling bin for the Monday morning pickup as he always does every Sunday night 
under the red pepper tree, its shower of pink peppercorns. As we wait for pie, the scent of the Easter pies baking. Alden is a bookman. The gift of a great bookman lies in his ability to pick out the right book for anyone. One can walk into a store and say, I want a book for my uncle, and he will come up with the perfect answer. Dubay's The Evidential Power of Beauty or Barth's A Lover's Discourse. It's like a seance, his accuracy, the bullseye of a great marksman, clairvoyant. Having never driven a car where it never snows, Alden knows life's all about slow drift. What counts is not how fast you arrive, but the weight of what you carry with you. My father faints at the top of the driveway. The neighbors call 911 without telling my mother, who doesn't know that the paramedics are on their way. She's washing dishes while smoking a cigarette and peers out the window just in time to catch the cherry red flash of a fire truck. The paramedics dragging my father off to the hospital. He dons, she dons my father's gardening shoes, runs out the front door and trips falling on the hard macadam of the driveway, breaking her hip and her wrist. And finally, she says to my father those words he's been waiting to hear all of his life. Harry, Harry, what would I ever do without you? You're the great love of my life. And they ride in the ambulance to the hospital, hand in hand. This, the denouement of a great love story. My mother in her bathrobe, the plush blue one with its elbows worn to mesh. It bears the history of a long marriage. It's cigarette burns and sewing needles and safety pins tucked into the lapel threadbare but faithful, parts of it worn away into vanishing, as she will. The stone has rolled away from the tomb, a marriage far removed from its wedding day, marriage itself falling away from its original intention, like this day with its pie. When Alden was pronounced dead, Christine called to tell me that Alden had regretted our last meeting. It was fine, I said, but Alden must have told Christine something different, a piece of gossip that I'll never hear. Oh, honey, he'd say. He always called me honey. You're just going through a hard patch. But we didn't fall out, I said. Why do I always think of the famed Phantom Palace of Paris when I think of Alden? I don't know, but Alden was like that. He could make you imagine a world polished into a high crystal gloss, not separate from snow. Hopkins, lovely asunder all white out and drift, the spirit spangled in the updraft and skein of a whoosh swept skyward into attraction, the flesh of it, this astonishing. Alden looked at me with those hazel brown eyes of his and that eye of the partridge sheen he gave off, the way everything shimmers, shimmering refracts, light just before it enters the tunnel to meet the light on the other side, traveling at the utmost speed one can manage, 
slipping under the mesmer of parado lights and bateau mouche on the water, the reflecting pools of fountains at Trocadero, a moment a photon in squall entering that quick and native light. And for the last time, I ask Alden to name the perfect book for me, expecting he'll say something like Pedro Paramo or the joy of man's desiring. But no, he must know. He must be able to feel the tension, like the limb tips of a bow pulled back at full draw. And he holds my face between his palms and says, how to pack a suitcase. Thank you. Thank you, Lise, that was beautiful. I'm glad to have you. And there again, there's a, a link to uh, Lise's book so that you can get some for yourself. Our next and final feature for today is Frank Paino, who I've come to know well and value as a friend on Facebook. His poems have appeared in a variety of literary publications. Um, since he starts with them, I guess I'll tell you what they are. And that includes Crab Orchard Review, Catamaran, North American Review, World Literature Today, Gettysburg Review, Burris Schooner, the Briar Cliff Review, Lake Effect, and a number of anthologies. His third book, Obscura, was published by Orison Books in 2020. His first two, The Rapture of Matter and Out of Eden, were published by Cleveland State University Press. Frank has received a Pushcart Prize, the Cleveland Awards Prize in Literature, and an Individual Excellence Award from the Ohio Arts Council. Um, I'll put his website in the chat because my husband has decided now to vacuum the floor. Sorry. So go ahead, Frank. Oh, sorry. I didn't know you were down there. Um, First, thanks to Jennifer and Lisa. Uh, this You are tough acts to follow, so I'm deeply regretting going third here. Um, I'm going to read four poems, and I'm telling you I'm going to read four poems because when I listen to readings, sometimes that's either a blessing or a curse. I can either be thinking, oh, God, there's three more, or there's only three more, so I'll leave it up to you to either be relieved or not when I start counting down. So the first poem I'm going to read is from um, Obscura, which came out in 2020 from Oars and Books. And uh, this is about a, a town in Venezuela called Potosi, which was in 1985 deliberately flooded uh, to create a reservoir for a hydroelectric power plant that was coming in. So I'm imagining uh, the circumstances around that. And it's called the Drowned Church of Potosi, Venezuela. The citizens are all gone to higher ground, having gathered what's essential and left the rest to breathlessness. Nothing remains but to watch as the damned river backs into the valley to await its churning rebirth into light. Let the elements exchange their mantles, fertile jade for an unquiet umber that will in time settle to a blue-green equilibrium. But for now, a quiet chaos as arched doorways, tiled roofs acquiesce to the insistent stroke of unnatural tide. Evenings, after the children have been put down in unfamiliar beds, the women will gather to weep, share visions of the catacombs beneath the church, backfilled with the heft of all that was left behind. Here, 
a cache of frankincense sifts down like amber snowfall. Here, a table too frail to endure such rough exodus catches in the corridors of the dead, who for their part turn and rattle against the stone. The displaced mothers speak of worn wooden pews that once cradled them, bearing now the weight of silt and plunging shadow. The scarlet curtains that muffled their sins drift like veils of wanton brides, while the carved altar with its relic stone flashes white in deepening currents that lick the chiseled thighs of the man who hangs lifeless on a cross too heavy to shoulder into the mountain's anoxic atmosphere. Soon, the silken hair that adorns his head will lift, then tangle in the thorns that weave his crown. Soon, the ribbed vault of ceiling, which once called back a host of hymns, will echo only the distant whine of turbans past the penstock the buzz of outboards which will carry the curious above the ruins. Rain and rain. The terrible hulk of water setting a new high mark each hour. On the final night, the refugees gather against a clamoring storm, pull capes close to goose-bumped flesh as the swollen reservoir hoists itself up toward the tower's cross-tipped steeple where the tongue of the ancient bell hangs mute as its throat begins to close. Though the women swear, one solitary toll thunders from the rising black, as if to beckon a cold-blooded congregation to enter and praise the power that is descending. Uh, this next poem is um, called Luna Moth, and it's from um, my um, chapbook. Everybody else is clever and is able to show the, the printing the right way. Mine's backwards, but it says Pieta. This book was selected by uh, Sadiq Deskoji, I believe this is the pronunciation of his name, is the winner of the uh, J. Carr chapbook contest. And this poem um, came out of my reading about the life cycle of uh, Luna Moth. I'm terrible with titles, so it's called Luna Moth. You will know two kinds of hunger. The first, a smaller sadness, a reciprocal thing that bends the stave of your long green days towards splayed leaves of sweet gum, fronds of walnut and smooth sumac that will invoke, after long weeks of exhortation, your exquisite metamorphosis. This is a hunger that drives you to feed without ceasing not as if you cannot get enough, but simply because. The hunger that will make you spin around each viridian segment of yourself a silken winding sheet, so you become, at last, your own still ghost, sealed within that perfect artifice, a single leaf from the tree in whose branches you will sleep until you wake to a strange annunciation that splits along the hardened seam of your solitude, calls you back into a world of night, your mouth not sealed, but vanished like a brief arc of a falling star. What's left for you will be the lot of every hungry ghost. This is the second hunger, which is the killing kind. It will ransom the sawtooth mandible or sea foam wings whose blind eyes face the stolen light of your namesake moon, while you drift, luminous, insomniac with desire, through the seven dwindling nights that are your destiny. Two more. This one's uh, called To the Corpse of Alexander the Great, uh, and uh, there are all sorts of rumors about where uh, Alexander's body may rest. Uh, no one knows for sure, so I'm playing kind of off that. To the corpse of Alexander the Great, present location unknown. Whether you lie amidst the tide of hymns and tourists' murmurs that seep past the groans of a sinking Venetian basilica, 
or wrapped by the melancholic wails that spill from soaring minarets beneath the city that bears your name. We have only scholars to suppose. Though we're told with some degree of certainty, your soldiers steeped the abandoned house of your flesh in drafts of wild honey, so it would keep eternally, like the fragrant dream of summer fields on a winter's, on winter's longest day. They bestowed on you a second immortality beyond fame's bloodied crown. So the hands that raised the sword beside them on a hundred battlefields might forever grant by torch or candlelight a sparkling commendation. So the lips that kissed Hephaestion would endure through ages beyond counting, ever plump and flushed as with a thousand bee stings. And uh, my last poem is called Fiat to Autumn. Fiat, not the car, but the word um, most, most of you will be familiar with as being the words uttered by the Virgin Mary to the angel Gabriel when he uh, proposed uh, that she accept uh, the proposition of becoming the mother of God. Uh, fiat meaning let it be done. And this poem is called Fiat to Autumn. It's also the first line of the poem. Fiat to autumn, to the sun that daily casts its requiem nets of shadow sooner across the copring meadows, to the phoenix forests that candle each branch without flame, to the black bear who plunders briar and bramble and bin, the scavenged, scavenged silver streams, to the dog who fish flops in the jazzy leaves, and to the leaves themselves, the deep incense of their dying. To the frost that shivers the mare's luxurious muzzle. To the salter of birds who tilt their wings toward warmer latitudes. To the ghost of vanished things, and to the ghosts themselves. Fiat to my heart that reckons its own measured season, to my flesh that will one day ascend, hear smoke, hear cinder, toward the loom stars from which it was woven. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frank, for that gorgeous reading. And thanks to all three of our features for astounding poems. And uh, I put your um, website uh, where people can find more information about your books and where to buy them. And I hope that some people will. Maybe everyone, if they don't already have it. So we're going to start the open mic. And again, uh, apologies to anyone who was unable to get in today. It's a very limited open mic because personally, I find it almost physically painful when they go on and on and on and it spoils all the good poetry for me. So assuming that some of you feel the same way, I try to keep this reading down a little. Um, let's start with Mark Petrie. And again, uh it's Five minutes or two poems, whichever comes first. Great. Uh, I'm going to be buying the artist's book today at independent bookstores because it's independent bookstore day. And I feel, I'm, uh, I feel pretty, this, the whole thing was beautiful. You guys read so well. I'm going to read a poem I'm working on, and I think I'm reading it because Alexis is on the uh, reading, and it's called Pirouette au Pas de Deux. And, uh, here it goes. The stream of everything that runs away, some say existence, like pirouette and pirouette, forever in one place, stands still and dances, but it runs away. That's from West Flowing Brook by Robert Frost. The Darth Vader skyscraper loomed ahead, 20 stories above the adjacent wildlife reserve. How strange the black cube against the thick scrub. Ballerina by Van Morrison in the seedy deck. 
spread your wings and fly straight to my heart. Words overwhelm me as I guzzle another can vodka martini. Don't want her smelling alcohol on my breath. She walks out of the building in her tailored blue suit, the skirt just below her knees, a pressed white blouse, chestnut hair reflecting the sun, a wearied face carrying the briefcase stuffed with legal files. She reaches to kiss me, pulls away before our lips meet. You've been drinking, noticing empty cans tossed in the back seat. Hand over the car keys. We switch places. She turns off the deck, uninterested in music or lyrics, interested only in my breath, the smell of vodka and vermouth. Silent all the way home. What the fuck did I do to piss off my fiance? She doesn't even listen. Her, first, her face tells me this is not the time to provoke argument. Silent walking into the apartment. Silent chopsticks eating sushi, then words. Wiping rice off her lips, she says, you will sleep on the couch. You need to stop drinking. I want you to go to AA. Get yourself sober. Then we will go to therapy together. Her tone so cold, it left no doubt to the seriousness of her words. Unexpected distance, no argument, no emotional back and forth, no tearful makeup moment. I thought she didn't want me. I was wrong. She wanted me more than ever, not the booze. She wanted my words, clean and sober, no drunken lyrics of self-pity. I didn't want to lose her. Looking at my drunken self in the bedroom mirror, eyes in a blood shot red pool. She was fighting for me. I joined AA, never drank again, spent years in therapy. 35 years later, the Darth Vader building casts its shadow on the preserve, but I am no longer in its shadow. She still wants me. I still write to reach her in my own sober lyrics, remembering a broken wing does not fly. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Jim? I have two shorter poems to share. The first is called Old House, Old Friend. Tonight, you crossed my mind, as you seem to do at odd times, moments when I have no reason to remember a phrase you turned, or a picture thought you gifted me of you in the garden, scolding the spreading sorrel, hurrying the impatience to bloom. Life is seldom easy, more so when we ache for more than the sound of only two feet on the hardwood floors. I have lived in many houses, some cozy, some cold, never thinking that one and only one would be my shelter from every wind and sun and rain. Perhaps houses are like cats and come to own you more than you might want, jealous if you stop to stand beneath another roof, closing doors against you for perceived diversions of attention or affection. I close my eyes and recall the lights, a silhouette across your curtained window. Remember again a word, a phrase, a poem that came to me in the shadow of your porch. Pause to place a letter in your mailbox and quietly, reluctantly walk away. And a second, not too long, one of those things you can't get away from. This is called Can't Hide From Mama. Unless you get too technical, by 19, I was gone. And whatever Mama wanted me to learn was done, finished, over. College and family and work. I left New Mexico behind, nothing there to pull me back. No tisk tisk to irritate me, aggravate me, when I insisted on spinning the wheel and taking whatever number fell beneath my hand. Somewhere along the way, Mama up and died, and I said goodbye out loud, 
shed at last of her looking over my shoulder. My gosh. Oversized frown at some choice I felt was mine alone to make. No one warned me about mama's ghost, the one that sneaks into the middle of a good dream, finger wagging in my face, and I wonder how'd she get there and how much did she see? On a cloudy day, sometimes, she slips into a stream of thought, leaving me to wonder if maybe I wasn't sun enough. And then there's times like just this afternoon, when the lady in the next car, window down, yapping like a chihuahua, wants to school me in the fine art of driving. And I already knew she never graduated that one. And the impulse flashes and my hand starts to raise and the single digit salute is already forming, but I can't, just can't, because I feel mama watching. Ooh. Wow, Taylor last line. And as Mary uh, remarked, I have lived in many houses would make a fabulous title for for a uh, collection, and I think I'll steal it, if you don't mind. I don't at all. Thank you. Our next reader is Alexis. I think she's having... Okay. She, yeah, gotcha. All right. Um, pleasure to hear you all today and to be a part of this. Uh, Robbie, thank you for hosting so well. Um, You're welcome. I have two poems, uh, kind of um, taking my cue from Mark, who asked me how things are going in the desert. And uh, I'm going to read a new one that is going to be in Vox Populi uh, later this year, and a second one. Uh, that you may know. Um, okay, first one is snake slash holding things down. There's a warning in the desert today, a high wind is howling, blustery, blowing everything away. My lovers put on heavy socks on the mats around the jacuzzi, trying to hold everything down so he doesn't have to capture it later. The towels, the lounge chairs, the barbecue, me. I bought a snake from Lowe's, he says. My lover's a do-it-yourself kind of guy, multi-talented, intellectual, paramour, sous chef, and handyman. The kitchen sinks back up. I point out the sludge, the glug, glug, each time I turn on the tap. He bends down to inspect the pipes. There's even a bit of butt crack. He threads the snake into the kitchen drain, coaxes it down. It makes a loud sucking complaint, the sludge reluctant to depart. I'm going back to Lowe's to get a bigger, longer snake, my lover says. Get a king snake, I whisper in his ear. I reach between his legs, cop a feel. Yeah, sure, he says, rolling his eyes, a king snake. He gives my roving hand a squeeze, or would you prefer a boa constrictor? Lately, things have been going well between us. We each learn to listen. I'm a writer, I play with words. He's a lover, he plays with me. I love him best when he's in my universe, takes note of the world around us through my rose-colored glasses, shares. Yesterday, it was the rainbow he saw on the way back from Lowe's. You should have seen it, baby, he says, every color, brilliant red to ultraviolet. He passes his iPhone to me. Look, he said, a shimmering arc of color holds down the horizon. I captured it for you. That's the first one. Uh, this is a, another desert poem. Um, been around for a bit. It's called For the Sad Waitress at the Diner in Barstow. Beyond the kitchen swinging door, beyond the order wheel and the pass-through piled high with bacon, hash browns, 
biscuits and gravy. Past the radio turned to 101.5 FM all country all the time. Past the truckers overwhelming the counter all grab ass and longing. In the middle of morning rush, you'll catch her in a wilted pink uniform, coffee pot fused in her grip, staring over the top of your head. You'll follow her gaze out the fly specked plate glass windows, past the parking lot, watch as she eyes those 16 wheelers barreling down the highway, their mud guards adorned with chrome silhouettes of naked women who look nothing like her. The cruel sun throws her inertia in her face. This is what regret looks like. Maybe she's searching for that hot day in August when she first walked away from you. There's a choking sound a semi makes when it pulls off the highway, that downshift of death rattle she's never gotten used to. Maybe she's looking for a way back. Maybe she's ready to come home. But for now, she's lost herself between the register and the door, the endless business from table to kitchen. She's as much left over as those sunny side eggs, yolks hardening on your plate. Thank you. Glad you could join us. Uh, our next reader is Mary McCarthy. Hi. Thank everyone who's read so far so wonderfully. Uh, I'm going to read the title poem from my book that just came out recently, uh, and it is How to Become Invisible. Lose your job, your mind, your husband. Step over the lines, off the map, into unmarked alleys. Talk too fast, too much, too loud, or not at all. Bulk at the strangeness of ordinary things. Spot the dark intent behind their blind disguises. Walk too close to the edge of every conversation. Answer the words behind the words, they say. Forget to smile, to wash, to comb your hair. Wear your clothes carelessly. Count the rough stitches or the patchwork world threatens separation. Carry your ghosts with you, shuffling and mumbling in a long procession that follows you down the street where no one sees you now. You've lost your place, your face, your reflection, and even your shadow fades to nothing in the unrelenting sun. And the other one, this is an older one. I hope you haven't heard it already. Persephone admits, there was no pomegranate. That was just mother trying to make me seem more respectable. No, a bride of hard changes, I turn on my own life from grief to exaltation. It was my black mood took me down in one long, smooth swallow into the arms of my own dark shadow, where I was at home in the underworld with its peculiar comforts, where the trees remember me because in my glory days, I went so fast I could count the steps in their long dance and hear them singing their names to the sun where their roots reach down to comb through my hair and lick the tears from my face like salty rain, where death is king and I am his queen, yearning for his deep embrace, my words like dry husks whispering our secrets in the dark. No one keeps me here. There was no need to swallow seeds or spit them out. I will rise again and again, triumphant like a rocket, consuming air, bright as the sun's corona, turning on the wheels of my own engine, dark and light, ice and fire, death and glory, burning too fast to care. Such wild rejoicing always comes with hell to pay. Thank you. Powerful. Thank you, Mary. 
Our next reader is Claire. We haven't seen her in a while, so welcome back. Thank you so much. Um, yes, I'm really happy to be here and, and thank you to the three readers um, earlier. I'm gonna read two short poems um, about a 16th century Mexican nun that I'm presently communing with and writing a series about. Sister Veronica. The day she entered the closed order, nuns gathered around her, like feral dogs sniffing an abandoned chocolate wrapper. She stood silent as a nun stepped forward to remove her clothes. A cold, hard rock formed in her stomach. She bowed her head, prayed the wounds which punctured her body would not bleed so freely today. Her prayers unanswered, she watched crooked hands, old, mangled fingers, reach out to trace rivulets of blood pooling at her feet on the tiled floor. She watched the abbess lick one finger and nod to the others, approving of all those hands poking at her naked body. Later, scrubbing herself red raw in the frigid shower, Veronica felt herself cracking, splitting into jagged pieces, heard again her father's voice, heard him hiss in her ear. She was his pleasure plum his forbidden fruit, remembered why she had chosen to come to God. And the second poem is probably the ending of this series. Sister Veronica always thought it was the wind would lay her down, but that last morning when she was sent out to pick wild herbs growing at the forest's edge, it was the clouds falling to earth, exploding droplets of fine mist whispered in her ears, crept up unseen up her nostrils, choked her at the back of her throat, clustered around her heart. Sister Veronica did not know how to breathe in the chill air, neither had she fully learned to exhale, an action which might have given her life had she wanted it. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Hope you'll come more often. I will. Our next reader is Marjorie. What a wonderful variety of poems we've heard. Um, I'm going to read two short poems. Um, it's been wonderful weather here the last few days. So this first one is called Fly a Kite Day, June 2022. In the wind is the curl of her grandma's gray, is the twirl of her mother's spin, is the sway of the willow's green while no longer tethered, the girl swings into a sky papered with kites. See how the bright diamonds, both flimsy and strong, dip into dreams she shares with them, women she knew only as passing breeze. Still she rises on their breath, hovers on their stories. It is the same air, and she is not the hand or the string, but with them a kaleidoscope of kites high in the sky and soaring. And the second one is a, a villanelle, um, insomnia somnolence. Her husband dead, my friend can't sleep. Another's lost his wife and naps around the clock. An old house weeps with all it sees, what it can't keep from slipping through the floorboard cracks to groan, your loved one's dead, don't sleep a second with a grief that keeps repeating when you wake, the trap of loss and clocks. An old house weeps, counts days and nights by sighs that leap ahead and back, recurring map to somnolence. My friends, we seep we sleep too much to stave off haunting grief that's always home. And when awake, the house won't rest, our dead won't sleep, regret or joy still can't release us from our weeping for the past. The husband, wife, the friend, asleep, awake, time's house, love's clock still creaks. Thank you. Thank you, Marjorie. Our next reader is Gary Grossman. Thanks, and uh, such an honor to read with everybody, uh, including the three features. 
These are two poems that I wrote uh, while I had a recent trip to the Northeast. The first is titled, Guy in a Thin Blue Parka Doing Tai Chi in the Last Available Parking Spot in the Restaurant Lot. I get it, Cape Cod, and you want the ocean to lick your face, not like a dog, but as a new baby gumming your cheek, because this is the heart's truest promise. It is early April, wind offshore, temperature 39 degrees Fahrenheit. The beach nestles just over the lot retaining wall, mottled with seaweed, water sanded pebbles, and white, white sand. If you squint, it turns into a variegated 80s den carpet, the one pattern to hide dirt. Tai Chi is beyond me. I know only that it exhales flexibility and tranquility, but this guy issues a loud and purposeful mammalian grunt every time his arms rise above his shoulders, hands clapped in some sort of prayer pose. Oddly, it seems like enraged Tai Chi, as if strong emotions and moving limbs could somehow blend karmically to inject peace into his corporeal chi. We've circled the parking lot three times to no avail, and here on the Cape, parking, as well as other things, are at a premium. Hunger plays an out-of-sync kettle drum in three different digestive tracts, as we edge the Subaru into this last space, thinking surely someone so mindful will grasp what is happening. We couldn't be more wrong. Waiting and watching, we discuss modes of communication, all the while trying to avoid being judge and jury as his belly roll flops vertically while he jerkily repeats several rounds of poses, each ending in prayer. Finally, Rob lowers the window and quietly yells, we'd like to park in this spot. The guy peers back at us as if we were the last three passenger pigeons in the Massachusetts of 1894, then moves to the right and resumes prayer pose in front of the adjacent car. It is warm in the restaurant as we inhale the clammy perfume of fresh chowder. And this next poem is called, All the Sheaves of Love. Glancing over at the 20 somethings sporting crimson stilettos, kitty corner from me in seat 23C, I notice the brim of her ball cap is pinned with crossed rifles. And my impression soars given she's earned a military sharpshooter's badge. So I put on my faux gold rimmed glasses and the rifles rematerialize into a fairy's outstretched wings and legs embroidered in steel colored thread, along with other fairy miscellanea, which makes me wonder if I really should have confessed to the lady next to me in 24E that I was the one who closed the overhead luggage bin indicating it was full even though she was able to punch one more paramecium-like bag and a purple nylon raincoat in, but only after several sparrow-like complaints flew out of her mouth. Those selfish folks who close overhead bins when they're not full. But my fear of damaged bags was legit because of potential harm to the 80-year-old fountain pen sequestered in my semi-soft carry-on. Pens that glow with a charisma that graces well-crafted old celluloid. The charisma of glowing embers and oak gall inks that helped ace the MCATs. And I look up in an abruptly flown back four decades because this startlingly chased Airbus 320 assembled in Toulouse has a smoking, no smoking symbol above every seat. And is there any country so uncaring it still allows smoking on commercial jets? When the corners of my mouth tug upwards and suddenly, I'm sorry, when the corners of my mouth tug upwards because I almost say aloud how very French this is, and suddenly my pancreas exudes a small hit of tranquility. And I recall sometimes 
All the sheaves of love are as simple as the seven-month-old baby behind me, who slept through the entire flight. Her lips, swallows wings set in a single satisfied smile. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Our last reader who will read one poem is Kika Dorsey. Hi, I, you know, I'm reading a poem about February and it's not February, but I think the ending has a levity that is taking us into spring. So um, it's called Winged. I miss the birds, I tell him, as a shaft of morning light releases from a crystal, rainbows crashing against the wall. In February, even the blackbirds don't sing on the cattails. The woodpecker doesn't hammer our roof. Morning doves and robins don't swoop or hop in our backyard's dry dirt. The parakeets we once kept in a golden cage have died, their ashes mingling on the slope of Bear Mountain. I can't feel flight, I continue. He is a silent landing. He is forgetting the boy of the sky, the one who dived off cliffs. He is a long road clinging to a canyon with walls only the mountain sheep know as well as I, my own feet, with their clinging tendons, how tired they are. I reach to touch my shoulders, ache for wings. Outside it snows. One bird was green with a blue tail feather. He would hop on my fingers, ride my shoulders as I cooked. Now I gaze out the window where a hawk rides the wind. Some seasons only the predators survive and the prisms are the promise of capturing light like a song, it's meandering notes. I'm hungry, listening, but wary of hunts. The hawk dives. The slaughter is not on February's calendar, just the aching, empty belly. I would fly to rainforests, I say, hot jungle, winged dirges of song, canopy calling me. But now all I remember is the girl I was, all the springs that found me risen. Good place to end our reading, Kika. Thank you so much to everyone, our wonderful features and our wonderful open mic. And it's always great to see all of you. Uh, and we have one more message from our editor, Jim Lewis. Thank you, Robbie. Just a note to all of you, Robbie has done a fabulous, fabulous job of organizing these readings and inviting some of the best poets I've ever been exposed to to feature for us. And thank you to our three features. I want to invite you to submit your poems to Verse Virtual, and I've posted a link to our website in the chat. Um, a lot of you on this reading today, I don't know. And I suspect that there are some excellent poems that would look great in our journal. And we would love to have you as part of the community. Just the caveat is there's a cap of 40 poets or the 10th of the month for submissions. And all that information is on the website. Thank you. And you take reprints. We do reprints and simultaneous subs. Thanks so much. I'm going to uh, turn off the recording. And then if you'd like, we can chat a little bit. Um, thanks. <laughs>